With the nut job 2 gracing us with its presence recently, I can't help but look back at the brutal, critical response to this franchise and wonder, what in the world went wrong here? The first movie made money, I mean, that's what made a second release possible, but as we've explored before on secondhand sequels, a strong box office number doesn't always mean strong storytelling. What's really surprising to me is that The Nut Job started as something really entertaining and interesting. But I'm not talking about the first movie. I'm talking about where it all began. As a little short film called Surly Squirrel. Mix a story with the laboratory, get a story laboratory. In 2005, Peter Lepeniotis created a computer animated short film called Surly Squirrel which was driven by a simple story premise. An unfriendly squirrel and his goony rat partner set out to smuggle a pizza from a garbage can before it can be taken by the neighborhood raccoon and his followers. Meanwhile, a full-scale armed bank heist is taking place just across the street, and the two situations eventually become closely intertwined. This is what the first nut job film was based on, and let me tell you, it's really entertaining and works well. Check out the link in the description to watch the full short film right here on YouTube. Now, granted, storytelling in a short film works differently than storytelling in a feature film, but Surly Squirrel gave the filmmakers some great building blocks to work with going into the nut job. A simple premise with entertaining characters pursuing a clear goal against a formidable foe. And that last piece is what we're going to explore today, and is what I think perfectly demonstrates a major strength of the short film and a major weakness of both feature films. The all-important antagonist. Just to get us up to speed, the first nutjob film revolves around a race between Surly Squirrel and the raccoon to obtain enough food to last through the upcoming winter. Surly wants the food for himself, while the raccoon, at first, wants the food to provide for his community. Instead of a pizza, this time their target is a nut shop, and the owners of the shop are planning to rob a bank. One quality of a compelling antagonist that may seem counterintuitive at first is that they often want the same thing as the protagonist. This is most obvious in genres like the sports film, where two teams or individuals are both competing for the same trophy, and in the romance, where two guys desire the same girl, but sometimes it's less obvious. In Lord of the Rings, for example, while Frodo and Sauron desire opposite outcomes, Frodo to liberate the world and Sauron to have power over it, they both need control of the ring to accomplish their goal. In the case of the Surly Squirrel short film, this dynamic is refreshingly simple and clear. Both Surly and the raccoon want the pizza, and only one of them can have it. For some reason, the creators decided to make this dynamic really confusing and convoluted in the first nut job movie. While it's clear from the outset that both Surly and the raccoon desire the nuts from the nut shop, things quickly get muddy when it's revealed nearly halfway through that rather than wanting to provide for his fellow creatures, the raccoon has a secret motivation to control the animals. Have you forgotten my motto? Animals are controlled by the amount of food they have. It it's is our, our duty to, to keep, keep it, it from them. them. Now at this point, Raccoon has sent Andy, a female squirrel, and a gang of other animals to steal nuts from the nut shop before Surly can take the nuts for himself. With this in mind, we can assume that Raccoon still wants the nuts, but instead of sharing them openly, maybe he's planning to ration them out in small amounts once he has them. Because like he said in the previous clip, animals are controlled by the amount of food they have. Okay, we can go along with that. However, soon after this, Raccoon sends his mole henchmen to flood the entire nut shop, meaning there won't be any nuts for anyone. So does this mean he doesn't need the nuts to have his control after all? Surly questions the mole about this, but instead of clearing things up, he kind of justifies our confusion. Less food means more control. If the heist succeeds, Raccoon will lose control of the park. If the heist succeeds, Raccoon will lose control of the park. So does that mean Raccoon doesn't want the nuts anymore? If so, why did he send a heist team in the first place? If he wants the nuts out of the equation, wouldn't he be okay with Surly stealing them for himself? So maybe we're confused about the raccoon's goal, but at least Surly's goal is still crystal clear, right? He's selfish and wants to steal the nuts for himself because he needs to fatten up for winter. However, Raccoon eventually has a face-to-face -face confrontation with Surly and makes us confused not only about his motivation, but about Surly's motivation too. 
Is this another one of your swindles? Some half-baked revenge against me? Wait, 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 wait. Revenge? Raccoon has known from the start that Surly's just a selfish guy who wants some nuts. It's something else, isn't it? You're trying to impress. Andy? Now Surly's doing this to impress Andy, the girl squirrel? What is the purpose of muddying the waters here? We can't root for either side if we don't know what they want or why they want it. Again, this is why the simplicity and clarity in the short film is so refreshing. One object of desire, two characters pursuing it, and two opposing philosophies. Me first and we first. Surly wants the pizza for himself and Raccoon wants the pizza for the community. Simple as that. This leads me to another very important aspect of the antagonist, the strong moral argument, which is the idea that the antagonist is more three-dimensional and more interesting when they have a compelling reason for what they're doing, even if that reason is flawed. Antagonist doesn't mean bad guy necessarily, it just means the opposition to the protagonist. As John Booker and Jeremy Casper point out in their Inside Out Story podcast, which is excellent by the way, this means if our protagonist is an unethical person, like Surly in the short film, our antagonist might very well be an ethical person, like the raccoon from the short film. We depend on the food that comes out of these trash cans. Oh. Whether we realize it or not, this makes the conflict more interesting, because we're not always sure who to root for. Now, in The Nut Job 2, Surly and the gang make the park their home after the nut shop explodes early in the story. And the conflict is driven by the money-hungry mayor of Oakton, who plans to build an amusement park on the land to rake in some extra cash. The good news is we've got a clear sense of character motivation, which the first film lacked. Both the protagonist and the antagonist want the same thing, control of the park. The animals want it so they can live there peacefully, and the mayor wants it to make some money. However, some issues come into play when we take a closer look at our antagonist, the mayor. It's safe to say that this guy is pretty much pure evil. He's selfish, he wants to take advantage of his own townspeople, and he's willing to hurt the animals that stand in his way. Now, pure evil can work in an antagonist, and in some genres like fantasy and horror, it's the norm. Let's take another quick look at Lord of the Rings, for example. You won't find a strong moral argument from Sauron, and he doesn't need one. Look at any zombie film. We won't see our main characters being lectured by the undead about how the apocalypse is a necessary part of progress. Pitting the extreme good against the extreme bad is what these stories are all about. But in other genres, it's usually more interesting if our protagonist and antagonist are closer to each other on the moral spectrum. Dipping back into the world of animation, let's take a look at Pixar's Toy Story 2 for an example of how this is handled really well. One of the main forces of antagonism in this story is Al, the loud and neurotic toy collector who steals Woody from a garage sale and plans to sell him at a museum in Japan. He's got some of the same qualities as the mayor in Nutjob 2, right? He's selfish, obsessed with making money, willing to act immorally to accomplish his goal. But the heart of Toy Story 2 revolves around Woody's existential dilemma. Is it better to be loved and die, or to be admired and live forever? Whether we like it or not, Al offers Woody something appealing, the chance to live forever, and this dynamic makes Al more complex than a purely evil character like the mayor. The thing is, there are so many things that could have been changed in The Nut Job 2 to present the forces of antagonism in a more complex way. For example, the mayor has a daughter who shares his disdain for the park animals and is basically an extension of the mayor himself. What if instead of being evil like her father, the daughter had a soft spot for the animals and secretly disagreed with the mayor's actions? Wouldn't that immediately make the story more interesting? The Nutjob franchise is a complete mess in almost every way, and with movies like this, it's easy to get overwhelmed by all the little problems. But by stepping back and looking at some of the fundamental issues, like the role of the antagonist, for example, things can start coming into focus. Thanks for watching this episode of Secondhand Sequels, and if you enjoyed it, feel free to hit subscribe to see more. As always, remember, story is king above all movie things. <laughs>
Do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do